Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Discover what's possible when people impacted by autism inspire change and build community. Together with the Global Autism Project, here's your host, Rachel Harmon. Hello, everyone. Our guest today is Cassidy Hooper. Cassidy is a 27-year-old autistic self-advocate from Mississippi who also has a rare genetic condition called Turner Syndrome. As the president of the ARC of Northeast Mississippi Autism Now Division, she mentors other autistic people and connects them with resources in their area. Some of her other advocacy work includes volunteering for Autism Grown Up and the Turner Syndrome Foundation. Cassidy also hosts her own podcast called The Diverse Butterfly, in which she spreads awareness about Turner Syndrome and aims to inspire others to follow their goals. Sadly, shortly after we recorded this interview, Cassidy's mother passed away from a sudden heart attack. This episode is in memory of Regina Hooper. Mrs. Hooper was a strong advocate for Cassidy throughout her life, always fighting for what she thought was best for her family. She was a sweet and caring mother, wife, grandmother, and teacher's assistant who loved children. Regina Hooper will be missed by Cassidy and so many others whose lives were touched by her kind and tender spirit. In today's conversation, we discuss what Turner Syndrome is and how it affects Cassidy's life, receiving her autism diagnosis at 17, her learning style and special interests, the lack of support for adults with disabilities in rural areas of the U.S., and advice for other girls and women with Turner Syndrome. In this episode, discover what's possible when a butterfly spreads her wings. To learn more about Cassidy, please visit our show notes at autismknowsnoborders.com. We appreciate your time. If you enjoy this podcast and you'd like to support our mission, please take just a few seconds to share it with one person who you think will find value in it too. You can also follow us on Instagram at Autism Podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Global Autism Project, and join our community on Mighty Networks at community.globalautismproject.org. And now I present you Cassidy Hooper. Hi, Cassidy. Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Thank you for being here today. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Rachel. (laughs) Could you please briefly introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Cassidy Hooper. I am 27 years old. I'm from Northeast Mississippi in the United States. And I was diagnosed with a rare genetic condition called Turner Syndrome. And I was also, when I was 17, diagnosed with a form of autism called Asperger's Syndrome which, as you all, all, the autism community knows that that's no longer considered a diagnosis. It's just on the autism spectrum. So I'm autistic. I'm an autistic adult. And I'm also a self-advocate. I do a lot of advocacy. And we're going to talk about that, I'm sure. And so, yeah, that's a little bit about me. All right. Thanks, Cassie. So let's start with talking about Turner Syndrome. What exactly is it, and how does it affect your life? Yeah, so Turner Syndrome is a rare genetic condition. It's a chromosome abnormality that occurs only in females. And in genetics, females have two X chromosomes. Well, girls with Turner Syndrome, they're either missing that second X chromosome completely or partially. And then there's classic Turner syndrome, and then there's mosaic Turner syndrome. I have classic. So with classic, it's when they're missing the second X chromosome completely, and they're more severely affected than mosaic. Mosaic Turner syndrome is when they're missing the second X chromosome partially and they're not as affected 
And there's a lot of health issues that come along with Turner syndrome, including infertility, which, you know, I knew that I cannot have my own children biologically ever since I was little. So, you know, that's a huge deal for individuals with Turner syndrome. You know, we struggle with that and we're high risk for diabetes and autoimmune diseases and things like that. And we have a lot of heart defects as well. I had CART, what they call CARTation of the aorta. And I had to have that repaired when I was nine days old, which is pretty common in Turner syndrome. And so that's how we found out that I had Turner syndrome. Because, you know, I had, you know, all the physical characteristics that come along with Turner syndrome, like short stature being the main one. I'm around 4'10", 4'11", which that's my final adult height. And I had to take growth hormone shots since I was three years old up until I was 17. And then I stopped, you know, to help me grow. And I take medications and things like that for my thyroid and stuff. And, you know, with the co-optation of the aorta, we found out they did what's called a karyotype, which is what determines your diagnosis of Turner syndrome. It's just like a blood sample. And so the results came back from the karyotype and it confirmed that I had classic Turner syndrome. So yeah, that's pretty much how that happened. And I haven't had any heart issues ever since my surgery when I was nine days old. And other than being short, how it affects my life is You know, I had visual spatial awareness issues and I struggled in school, especially math, which is pretty common in Turner syndrome to struggle in math. And I don't drive and because of my visual spatial awareness issues and not be able to judge distance and things like that. So, yeah, that's pretty common in nonverbal learning disability and things like that that come along with Turner syndrome so yeah that's pretty much what Turner syndrome is okay so are people usually diagnosed shortly after birth yeah or they can be diagnosed when their mom is pregnant with them Mm. sometimes in utero so it can be diagnosed before or after and there's some actually that are diagnosed late in life because they haven't shown any, you know, symptoms, like especially mosaic Turner syndrome. There's not many of the physical symptoms. They, they seem, you know, it seems everything's going normal. And then, you know, late in life, they struggle, especially with infertility and things like that. So yeah, things like that, they don't, notice until late in life and then they're diagnosed but then there's girls like me with Turner syndrome that shown symptoms ever since I was born and especially the physical characteristics and things like that that they notice so yeah some are diagnosed when they're in utero or shortly after they're born or even late in life you know it just depends on the severity mm-hmm And you said it's pretty rare, right? Do you know how many people, like what percentage of the population have Turner syndrome? Yeah, one in every 2,000 female live births. Okay. So only 2% of females with Turner syndrome, fetuses with Turner syndrome, make it to birth. Oh. So, yeah, I'm definitely a miracle. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Here to tell your story and spread awareness. Yeah. What are some unique experiences of having both Turner syndrome and autism? Like how does autism affect Turner syndrome and vice versa? So like I mentioned, I think, you know, the visual spatial awareness issues and, you know, things like that go hand in hand with both Turner syndrome and autism. And executive functioning go hand in hand with both Turner syndrome and autism. And I do have very poor executive functioning. And so I think that those are the 
main two things that go hand in hand with both that I struggle with the most. I see. And you received your autism diagnosis when you were 17, you said? Yes. So what was that like for you to find that out about yourself? Well, we kind of knew, we kind of suspected that something else was going on besides Turner syndrome. I wasn't really connecting with my peers and I was, I stayed to myself most of the time and I didn't really connect and socialize. I had, you know, I didn't really socialize like everybody else. And so my mom did a lot of research and she came across autism, specifically Asperger's syndrome. And she was like, yeah, that fits me to a T. So we went to a psychiatrist to confirm the diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome and he confirmed it. So at that point, did you know what autism was like you personally? No, not then, but now I know a lot more since my diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So what was your childhood like? Did you receive any services growing up? Yeah, I did. I was in special education and I had an IEP up until fourth grade, my bad. And then after fourth grade, they decided that I didn't need an IEP because, you know, I was doing so well academically. And they're like, you know, she she doesn't need this. But, you know, we still, the teachers were so understanding about my diagnosis and they were accommodating and they let me take extra time on tests and assignments and stuff like that and were real patient with me and understanding. So I'm real appreciative of that. And also I did occupational therapy and things like that. I didn't walk until I was like 19 months and then I started talking when I was three in my childhood because of my Turner syndrome I was sick a lot as a baby and had a lot of health issues as a baby and that's mostly you know how my infancy was like you know being sick all the time in the hospital But yeah, so mostly my childhood was like that. But then as I got older, I started to socialize more. Like I told you in school, I was not very social, but especially my senior year, I got more comfortable with my classmates and things like that. And then into adulthood, I got more comfortable socializing. And so now I'm very sociable and you know, nice and friendly and to people. But when I was growing up, I wasn't very sociable. And Mm -hmm. now into adulthood, uh, you know, I learned to connect more. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Did something change to help you connect more? Yeah, I think that just being part of a community, like, you know, everybody being so supportive of my diagnosis, my dual diagnosis, and, you know, being so understanding and accepting, and especially the online community with autism and Turner syndrome. You know, I connected to a lot of people on Facebook groups and things like that online, and it made me open up more about my diagnosis of Turner syndrome and autism. And knowing that I'm not alone in my experiences has been really helpful to open up more. Yeah. And I hope that people who listen to this who also might have some similar struggles can feel validated knowing that they're not alone. Yeah. What are your strengths related to autism? Yeah, my strength is that I'm very detailed and very hyper focused on certain things. And I think that that's very, can be very helpful, especially in the workforce and all that, where, you know, you pay attention to detail and stuff. And I know a lot of autistics are like that. And I think that's one of my strengths. And another one of my strengths is that I'm very friendly to people and very kind. And that can be very helpful also. 
And yeah, so I think that those are two of my biggest strengths. Do you have any special interests? A lot of people with autism, like you were saying, who are very hyper-focused on something, become very passionate and kind of gravitate towards a special interest. What's yours? Yeah, I like like a lot of entertainment and TVs and movies and celebrities. And that's like my special interest. What are some of your favorite movies? I'm really into like drama, comedies. I'm a female, so I like the, you know, the romance and movies that make you cry and all that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I like the Nicholas Sparks movies, like A Walk to Remember is one of my favorites. Oh, with Mandy Moore. Yeah, I love that. I cried. (laughs) Yeah. And a lot of movies like that, but I also like comedy and things like that. So, Mm -hmm. What's a recent movie that you've seen that you really liked? I'm trying to think. It's not like a recent movie, but we really, really love the movie called, I don't know if a lot of people has heard of it, but it's called Sling Blade and it has Billy Bob Thornton and John Ritter and a lot of famous people on it. And it's so funny. I haven't seen that one. Yeah, it's it's funny. But, you know, that's one of my favorites. And, yeah, I like Simon Birch, which mm-hmm. is also a sad movie. But, you know, it's one of my favorites as well. So, mm-hmm. yeah. What is it about watching movies that you like? Yeah, I just like the storytelling. And I like movies with a good message as well like I like like the message and the storytelling of movies so Mm -hmm. it's also kind of like an escape into a fantasy land right yeah I know a lot of autistic individuals can relate to that Mm -hmm. yeah it's especially good when the characters are really developed and you can relate to them and what's happening in their lives even if it's someone who's in a completely different country or has a completely different lifestyle, if the movie is good, you can actually put yourself in that person's shoes. Yeah. So anything else you want to say about movies or special interests? Yeah. I, like I mentioned, I like music as well. I'm really into this Christian rock band named Skillet. So I'm in a rock pop. A little bit of everything. When I was a kid, I was really into Miley Cyrus and Hannah Montana. And I was really into Disney and the Disney shows and uh, Lizzie McGuire, Hilary Duff, Raven and all that stuff. And, you know, yeah. Got it. So what do you wish the world knew about autism? One thing I want them to know about autism is that it doesn't end at 18 it's throughout the lifespan Uh, it's not just in childhood but it's throughout life and it's a lifelong condition and it's not a bad thing to ask for help or support when you need it and that you shouldn't let autism define you as a person you shouldn't let that hold you back Because you can do anything you set your mind to, and you're very capable of doing anything that you want to do in life. And you shouldn't let your, well, so-called disability affect your life because, you know, it's just a diagnosis. It It doesn't define you. There are a lot of autistic people who strongly identify with the autistic community, and, you know, they say that without autism or, you know, without the diagnosis, they would be a completely different person. So it's kind of hard also to separate the two, right? Right. Most definitely. Yeah. You know, it'll always be a part of me, you know, part of my identity. But like I said, it doesn't define me. But like you said, autism makes me who I am today. You know, I wouldn't be who I am. And I wouldn't have met 
individuals like you or anybody else in the community if it wasn't for that. So I met so many amazing people through the autism community and the Turner Syndrome community. So I'm very grateful as well for that. Mm -hmm. What do you wish the world knew about Turner Syndrome? For Turner Syndrome, I just want people to know that the same thing with autism, that it doesn't define you. It's just a diagnosis. But, you know, I'm also grateful, like I said, about the people I met through the Turner Syndrome community. And we're also very capable. And I think the only thing that, you know, affects me with Turner Syndrome is just my short stature, which is totally fine. So I think that with Turner Syndrome, it is a rare condition. So not a lot of people know about it. And I think it's so important to raise awareness about it because, you know, there's a lot of stigma with Turner Syndrome and autism. Us as self-advocates can step up and, you know, say that these are our experiences and we need to erase the stigma that surrounds these diagnoses. Are there any ways that you feel misunderstood? Yeah, I mean, I think that the one misconception, the way I feel misunderstood, is that we're not able to do anything on our own, you know, and that's not true. We're very capable, and we can do anything that neuro or neurotypicals can do we just learn differently and do things in our own way. And that's not a bad thing. That's one thing I want people to know about. That's the one way I feel misunderstood. When you say that you learn differently, could you describe that a little bit more? Yeah, you know, it just, for me, I had to take my time and I do things at my own pace. You know, I may not do things as fast as other people, but I can still get it done, but at my own pace and at my own time. You know what I mean? It's Mm -hmm. like you do things your own way in your own time and not the way people expect you. Are you more of an auditory learner or a visual learner, or do you have some other special accommodations? I think a little bit of both. And I think that it helps me actually, if I'm like in school, like if I'm actually in the classroom, that helps me more when I'm working one-on-one with the teacher or professor or someone like that or the educator. It helps me if they break it down one-on-one with me. And, you know, that helps me a ton when I'm learning. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes for a lot of people on the spectrum. You know, you need to break it down and work with them one-on-one and be patient with them and figure out how they learn. So, yeah, I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. Are you receiving any support now? Not at the moment. But, you know, I'm doing a lot of advocacy, um, which we can talk about that as well. Mm -hmm. So are you not receiving any support because you don't need it or because there's nothing available for you that you would want? Right now, there's nothing available in my area, which we can also talk about the lack of services for autistic adults, especially in rural communities and Like me, I'm in Mississippi, so it's very hard to find services. Mm. And I think that that needs to change. You know, the lack of services, the lack of support for autistic adults, uh, because there's not a lot. What kinds of services do you wish you could receive right now? I think for me, like learning independent living skills money management and how to budget and, you know, how to do all the things that are important for adulthood 
and important to live on your own and how to, you know, live independently and learn all these skills that are important going into adulthood and that are important to be successful into adulthood is, I think, the most important for autistic. Do you live with your family right now? Yes, I do. I live with my parents, my mom and my dad. And so, yeah, I think a part of me wants that freedom. But a part of me is so grateful for all that my parents have done for me in my life. And so it's kind of a mix. Um, Want that freedom, but also, you know, grateful for everything that they do for me. Mm -hmm. Do they try to teach you some skills so that you can live on your own? Yeah, yeah. You know, for me, my motivation in my executive functioning is really poor. Like, I'm not as motivated uh, to, you know, help out around the house or things like that. But they try to teach me stuff that may help me in the future to live independently. I know it's hard, but it's so important to teach those skills so that you can live on your own and create a life of your own. Yeah. So are most adults who live in your community living with their families because they don't have access to services to help them live on their own? Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So some autistic people argue that autism is not a disability, that it's actually society that needs to change and the environment needs to change so that people are given opportunities to do things. Yeah. So what do you think about this when you hear the word disability? What does it mean to you? I kind of agree that we are capable to do things, but also in that other hand there are times where I feel like I am disabled because you know there are certain things that I need support in and need guidance in but at the same time I don't think you know as you can tell I'm real verbal and smart and capable but yeah I'm kind of on the fence about the word disability Sometimes I think it can be a, a bad thing because it does like limit us. It feels like that word misleads people into thinking that we can't do the things that other individuals can do. And that's not that's not true. But at the, on the other hand, there are times where I feel like I need support. So, yeah, that's how I feel about it. Got it. So about the executive functioning skills, can you give some examples of some instances that you might struggle? Yeah, for me, it's just independent living or daily living skills. Like I had to be reminded to do stuff sometimes. Sometimes I don't have to be reminded, but sometimes my mom's like, you have to do this or you have to do that. And you know, that's where my executive functioning, I'm not, I can't initiate a task very well. And that's one big thing about my executive functioning deficits is not, not being able to start a task or I have to be reminded sometimes to do stuff. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's one big thing. Got it. Do you have some tools to help you? Or do you rely on your mom to help you with that? Yeah, I mostly rely on my mom for, for that. So, Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever think about what would happen if your parents weren't around? Yeah, I think about that all the time. And it just, it concerns me, you know, about like how I'm going to be able to take care of myself when they're not around anymore and how, what would happen to me. And so I worry about that a lot. And that's why it's so important for me to advocate and to 
try to find services or create services for autistic adults because I know some autistic adults, you know, they live independently and they have jobs and children and everything. And I just feel like sometimes that, like, why can I be like that? You know, and, and I know some people that could be in the same situation that I am. And I don't want that to, you know, it shouldn't be that way. So I want that to change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to try to advocate for more services that help individuals like me to help learn these skills and to help try to get out in the community and learn how to contribute to society and how to become more independent as an adult. Yeah. Unfortunately, in the U.S., a lot of the services that are available through insurance or through the government, they stop at a certain age, yeah. like 20-something. Do you know? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe it depends on the state. Yeah. Right. So then in these places where maybe families don't have the income to pay out of pocket and hire a professional privately, they're kind of left with no option. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's so disheartening and so frustrating. And so, yeah, that's why I want it to change. And that's why I advocate for the community because, you know, it shouldn't be that way, but it is. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I want to help other individuals so they don't have to go through that. Yeah. Got it. Well, the work you're doing is so important, Cassidy. Thank you so much. You know, with May being Mental Health Awareness Month, we're trying to bring more awareness to the mental health issues that people with autism face, like anxiety and depression, and there are high rates of suicide with the autistic population. Do you suffer from any of those things? Yeah, sometimes I do. You know, I can get anxiety or depression every now and then, uh, but I take medication to try to help me with that. So, and I know a lot of other individuals with autism are the same. So, yeah, I think it's pretty common. Yeah. And I can just imagine that the uncertainty of the future, you know, your living situation with your parents are gone could maybe just add a little bit more stress to that. Yeah. Well, do you do anything to take care of yourself? Do you have any self-care practices? Not that I know of. <laughs> Watching movies, maybe doing your special interests. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That helps soothe me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Helps me relax. You know. Yeah. Are you employed? No, not at the moment. But I do a lot of volunteer. You know, I said with the ARC, I do a lot of advocacy and podcast interviews and things like that. So, yeah, that keeps me pretty busy. <laughs> have you ever been gainfully employed? No, I have done voc rehab, vocational rehabilitation, but, you know, that didn't work out. So right now I'm just doing some volunteer or whatever I can do to keep busy. Mm -hmm. And you're 27, you said, right? Yes. What are your big dreams for your future? My dream is to help individuals on the autism spectrum, our girls and women with Turner Syndrome, you know, to help them, mentor them and guide them into the right direction and to help them in any way I can. So that's my big dream is to help both individuals with autism and Turner Syndrome. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your advocacy work. What are some of the things you do with your volunteer position? Yeah, so right now I am the president of the ARC of Northeast Mississippi Autism Now Division, which basically I help connect people to resources in the community that may help, and I help guide them into the right direction to help them succeed so basically I'm a guide and 
a mentor for individuals on the autism spectrum of all ages, including adulthood. And, you know, hopefully once this pandemic dies down, we can start doing community outreach, like like community events, like in social gatherings and things like that. And also we won't start doing like trainings and webinars, things like that to help the community learn about autism and to help individuals on the autism spectrum themselves, you know, help them contribute to the community and help them get out in the community. So I hope that's my big goal for the Autism Now Division. And I was the online community manager for a nonprofit organization called Autism Grown Up, which is founded and she's the executive director. Her name is Dr. Tara Regan, and it's based in North Carolina, and they're mostly online, and they focus on autism in adulthood. So they help autistic individuals transition to adulthood or to help them navigate adulthood, and they have a lot of tools and resources to help with that. So, you know, I'm really grateful for that opportunity and the opportunity to help with the ARC and everything. And I'm also on the awareness committee and the Facebook subcommittee for the Turner Syndrome Foundation. They're based in New Jersey. And so I've been helping a lot and just doing a lot of advocacy for that as well. And, you know, the ARC advocates for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, including autism. And so I know that's a lot, but you know, I've been helping out any way I can. <laughs> yeah, you are busy. And you yeah. you mentioned you host your own podcast. It's called The Diverse Butterfly. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I started that because I wanted to share my experiences and have others share their experience about Turner Syndrome and autism. And I had self-advocates professionals, doctors, anybody who has a connection to Turner Syndrome and autism, you know, girls and women with Turner Syndrome, autistic self-advocates to share their stories and their perspectives. So, yeah, that's been great. And the reason why I called it the Diverse Butterfly Podcast is because with Turner Syndrome, the logo for the Turner Syndrome Society of the United States is a butterfly oh. and we refer to ourselves as butterflies so that's why the where the butterfly came in and the diverse butterfly podcast you know with turner syndrome and autism we're so diverse and so unique in our own way so that's why i called it the diverse butterfly podcast so yeah it's been great to speak with people and have them share their experiences and their perspectives and what's going on in the community. So I'm real grateful for that. And so, yeah, so if anybody wants to be a guest who's watching, um, I would love them. Um, I'm Cassidy Hooper on Facebook and Miss Cassidy Eden on Instagram. And you can email me as well at CassidyHooper19 at gmail.com. That's all lowercase, and I'll be happy to have you on. Wonderful, and we'll share all of your contact information in our show notes. Yeah. So, Cassidy, you also just recently joined our Global Autism community. Yeah. And this is our online community where we bring self-advocates and family members and professionals and autism services all together to engage in meaningful conversations in a safe space. So what are you looking forward to about the global autism community? Yeah, I'm so excited about the global autism community because to be able to connect, especially with other self-advocates and professionals that connect us to resources and, you know, other self-advocates to share their stories and their perspectives on what's going on in the community. So I'm very excited about that. All right. 
Well, Cassidy, I'd like to close with one last question. What advice would you give to other girls or women who have Turner syndrome? Yeah, I just say that do not be afraid. I know it's scary at first, but you can do anything you set your mind to. Do not let your Turner syndrome diagnosis define you as a person. It may be a part of you, but you shouldn't let that stop you. And so I hope that anybody watching with Turner Syndrome can be inspired by my story and other girls and women with Turner Syndrome or autism. And I hope this helps them do whatever they set their mind to. All right, Cassidy, thank you so much for sharing your story with us and spreading some awareness. You're welcome. Thank you for having me, Rachel. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. Due to the lack of resources and training in many areas of the world, a great number of autistic adults depend on their families for support. When a caregiver passes away, autistic individuals face unique challenges on top of the grief that is naturally experienced in these situations. As a society, how can we better prepare autistic children to live independently and become gainfully employed adults, no matter where they're from? This episode has reminded me of just how short and precious life is. Hold your loved ones close and cherish every moment you spend with them. Cassidy, our hearts go out to you and your family. I'm sure your mother would have been so proud of you for sharing your message with the world. Thanks for listening, everyone. Take care. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. You've been listening to Autism Knows No Borders, brought to you by the Global Autism Project. You can find Rachel's notes for this episode and learn more about today's guests at autismknowsnoborders.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. By doing so, You'll be helping us increase awareness and acceptance of autism around the world. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.